and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. In the last couple of episodes, we've been talking about the Thirty Years' War. This is a religious conflict that started in the Holy Roman Empire with Protestants, dukes, and princes fighting against the Catholic Emperor Ferdinand II. But this war would ultimately draw in multiple outside powers, including the powers of the Dutch Republic, Denmark, and Sweden on the Protestant side, and the Spanish Empire on the Catholic side. If you were a new listener, I'd highly suggest you go back to episode 36, A Fire in Bohemia, and start there. But if you are feeling confident, go ahead and keep on listening. And I say that because the Thirty Years' War is one of the most complicated wars in history. It goes on for three decades, and the combatants are always changing, right? Denmark gets into the game for a few years, then taps out. Even so, at least so far, we have been able to draw a line between the two sides. From 1618 to 1635, if I were to tell you the religion of a European ruler, you would know which side they favored, Protestant or Catholic. But as I mentioned at the end of the last episode, things are about to change. In 1635, King Louis XIII of France, a Catholic, is going to officially enter the war on the Protestant side. He does so at the urging of his first minister, Cardinal Armand Jean Duplessis, Duke of Richelieu, who is better known to history as Cardinal Richelieu. And in my humble opinion, by the way, uh, Cardinal Richelieu is probably the most underrated figure in all of history. You can judge for yourself anyway. Uh, Richelieu is a man of the church, but he takes the Protestant side in the war for more mundane reasons. Good old-fashioned power politics. See, at this time, the German branch of the Habsburg family rules in the Holy Roman Empire, while the Spanish Habsburgs have not just Spain, but also the Duchy of Milan in northern Italy, as well as the Spanish Netherlands. Right. If you look at a map at this time in Europe, uh, France is basically surrounded by Habsburgs, and Richelieu sees this as an existential threat to the French Bourbon dynasty. In fact, France has already been involved in the Thirty Years' War behind the scenes well before they actually get French troops involved directly in the action. So before we go forward and talk about the next phase of the war, let's go backward. I want to talk about what's been going on in France all this time. So set your time machines back to the year 1585. The place is Paris, France, and young Armand Jean Duplessis, the future Cardinal Richelieu, is born. The newborn baby is so sickly that his parents won't even take him out of the house. And even in these very pious times, it is not until May of 1586 that he's actually baptized, which is eight months after his birth. But despite his frail childhood, Armand is his parents' third son. And there is a tradition among Catholic European nobility. The eldest son inherits the lands and title. The second son joins the church. And the third son joins the military. So as the third son, Armand only receives a basic education, roughly the equivalent of high school today, uh, before he enters the academy, uh, which is France's newly founded military academy. And he does this at the age of 15. 
In the academy, he learns the art of war, which will prove useful during his long career. By the way, he also engages in the kind of romantic pursuits you might expect from a young nobleman with a military career ahead of him. Uh, suffice it to say that he will have to be treated for gonorrhea during this time frame. But fate has different plans in store for the young Armand Duplessis. In 1602, his older brother, Alphonse Louis, the second son of the family, runs off to join a monastery. Now, this might be in the spirit of the whole second son joins the church rule, but Alphonse had been meant for greater things. He was supposed to become the Bishop of Lucan, which, uh, long story short, uh, the Pope had given approval for the Plessis family to appoint that bishop, and the position would have brought tremendous wealth and prestige into the family. Well, maybe not tremendous wealth, but some wealth. Anyway, it would have brought more to the family than a poor monk who has taken a vow of poverty uh, can offer. And with no other family member to leave that bishopric to, Armand's mother asks him to withdraw from the academy, complete his normal education, and try to become a bishop. And he does indeed drop out. He completes a course at university and is ordained a priest, and in 1607 he is consecrated as the bishop of Lucan. Uh, he actually has to go to Rome, by the way, and meet with the Pope in person to get permission for this. See, he's only 22 years old, and at that age, Armand is too young to be a bishop under church law. But the Pope makes an exception. And another thing that happens in 1607, in September of that year, Armand Duplessis becomes a member of the Sorbonne. Uh, which at the time is the theological faculty at the University of Paris. It's a pretty serious position for a bishop to be in, pretty prestigious, especially for such a young man. Uh, he remains in Paris for a year, building connections and even getting to know King Henry IV a little bit, but in 1608... A year after becoming bishop, he heads southwest to Lucan to take over personal administration of his bishopric. And when he arrives, he is deeply disappointed in Lucan's poverty, and in one letter he actually calls it, quote, the most villainous, filthy, and disagreeable diocese in the world, unquote. But he's going to make the most of what he's got. During his time in Lucan, Armand rebuilds the bishop's palace, which had fallen into decay. He also becomes popular with the local people, who were, as you might have guessed, mostly poor in this area. And when they complain that they don't have enough to eat because of excessive taxes, Armand writes first to the local tax collector and then to the local duke himself to get them relief. And Armand remains in his diocese for two years, but in 1610, King Henry IV dies, leaving the throne to his son, Louis XIII. Louis is only nine years old, though, and like the soon-to-be Cardinal Richelieu, he is a sickly child. Since he is so young, the kingdom is ruled by his mother, Marie de' Medici, and her close advisor, the Italian politician Concino Concini. Concini, in turn, by the way, is probably being paid by the king of Spain to promote Spanish interests. At least that's what a lot of people think. France, at this time, has a large population of Protestants, who were called uh, Huguenots. Henry IV had actually been a Huguenot before converting to Catholicism to take the throne, and his reign had been a time of religious toleration. 
But while Marie de' Medici maintains his tolerant policies, key Protestant leaders are concerned that she and eventually Louis XIII is going to roll back those freedoms. So, in 1614... Henry II de Bourbon, Prince of Condé, a close relative of Louis XIII, leads a group of Huguenots in a walkout from the royal court. They begin building an army to defend their religious freedoms, but eventually they come to an agreement before this becomes an all-out rebellion. Both sides will stand down, and they will convene a meeting of the Estates General. The Estates General is an assembly of the leaders from throughout France, and at the time, it's France's only national legislative body. The term Estates comes from the fact that the representatives come from three different classes. The first estate refers to the Catholic Church and represents bishops, priests, monks, and nuns. The second estate refers to the landed nobility, local dukes and counts, petty princes, and so on. And uh, the third estate refers to the people, or more accurately, uh, the professional and merchant classes, what we modern folks would call the bourgeoisie. Marie de Medici rigs the elections to ensure that a majority of representatives from all the estates are pro-royalist. And among the representatives for the first estate is none other than the Bishop of Lucan, Armand du Plessis. In the 1614 meeting of the Estates General is not that important in and of itself. Perhaps the most notable thing about it is that this would be the last time the Estates General would meet for 175 years, and their next meeting in 1789 would kick off the French Revolution. But in February of 1615, when the Estates end their session, Armand du Plessis is chosen to give the final oration. Interestingly, the speech actually clashes with much of his political philosophy. He doesn't actually agree with a lot of what he's saying, but instead of speaking for his own beliefs, he does his duty and he summarizes the opinion of the majority of delegates. Like I said, what happened at the estates is an important, actually, Nothing got done, really. This was just sort of a meeting of the estates that allowed the rebellious nobles to say that they had held the estates and save face uh, when they were backing down. But what is important is that it is through this closing speech that Armand du Plessis first comes to national prominence. Later in 1615, Marie de' Medici makes her crowning achievement. She successfully marries her son, Louis XIII, and her daughter, Elizabeth, to the two children of the King of Spain. This double marriage, as it's called, upsets all of French foreign policy, since it effectively makes France into an ally with the Habsburgs. This goes against what the French have been trying to do, at least over the past few kings, which is not get surrounded by Habsburgs. In response to this, the Prince of Condé, the major Protestant leader, uh, he launches another rebellion. And in 1616, Marie de' Medici once again makes concessions, promising not to abandon France's existing alliances with Protestant powers. As a matter of fact, Condé even gets a spot on the royal council. Sort of one of those keep your friends close but your enemies closer type deals. And it's around this time that Armand du Plessis earns his own position on the council for the first time. 
he is admitted as almoner to Louis XIII's young wife, Anne of Austria. And the almoner is sort of a person who is responsible for managing the young princess's philanthropic activities. He is a financial manager of sorts in this role, but he proves his worth as an informal ambassador to the Prince of Condé and other Protestant leaders. By this point, uh, Marie de' Medici's Italian friend, Consino Concini, right, that guy who may or may not be getting paid by the King of Spain, well, he is now first minister in all but name. And in a complex plot, he and some other ministers have the Prince of Condé arrested along with a handful of other nobles on trumped-up charges. Now, this once again cements Catholic dominance over the royal council, and Richelieu is promoted to Secretary of State in the now slightly smaller royal council. And in this position, he finds the army desperately short of money, and he even advances some of his own wealth to pay the French troops. And this is fortunate for the Catholic Royal Council, since the Protestant nobles who haven't been arrested, they're upset about uh, Condé and the others being arrested, and while well, these nobles who are still free are raising a rebellion. In his book, Cardinal Richelieu, 19th century British historian Richard Lodge writes, quote, Richelieu and his colleagues succeeded in dealing the princes more severe blows than they had experienced at any previous period of the reign. Envoys were dispatched to England, Holland, and Germany to remove any suspicion that might have been excited by the Spanish marriages and to prevent any assistance being given by these powers to the rebels. The instructions to Schomburg, the ambassador to Germany, were drawn up by Richelieu himself and contain the clearest exposition of the position and policy of the court. At the same time, three armies were set on foot to act simultaneously in the Ile de France, Champagne, and the Nivernais. Everywhere the royal troops carried all before them. The eyes of Europe were fixed upon the siege of Soissons, where the Duke of Mayenne was blockaded by the army under the Count of Auvergne. Unquote. A year later, in the spring of 1617, this particular siege of Soissons is still going on, but the young King Louis XIII is now coming into his own. He is 16 years old, he is legally an adult, and he's good friends with a guy named Charles d'Albert, who is the royal falconer. And d'Albert convinces Louis that it's time to take the throne for himself, and to do that he's going to have to arrest Concini, just like Concini had the Prince of Condé arrested. Richard Lodge continues, quote, The plot against Concini was arranged as secretly and successfully as that against Condé. No suspicions had been aroused in the mind of the favorite when, on April 24th, he was arrested on the bridge leading to the Louvre. He had only time to ejaculate, I am a prisoner, when he was killed by three pistol bullets. His captors excused their precipitancy on the ground that he had offered resistance. All precautions had been taken. The Queen Mother's guard was disarmed, and she found herself a prisoner in her own apartments. Concini's wife was arrested, brought to trial, and executed. The body of the murdered man was disinterred by the mob, hanged by the feet on the Pont Neuf, dragged in hideous triumph through the streets, and finally burnt. Unquote. Marie de Medici is imprisoned in a castle in the Loire Valley, while Louis fires her biggest supporters on the council. Interestingly, he does not fire Armand Duplessis. Instead, 
Armand voluntarily resigns from the council and goes to Avignon, where he busies himself with religious writings. This leaves the royal falconer, the Charles de Albert, as the most powerful man in the kingdom other than the young Louis XIII. Louis makes him the commander of the Bastille, which is an essential fortress for the control of Paris. And then the next year, 1618, the Thirty Years' War breaks out. At this time, it's a local rebellion in Bohemia. Nobody's calling it the Thirty Years' War. It's not even a general European war of any sort. It's just that rebellion over there in Bohemia. But even so, France's interests are split. On the one hand, the war is a Protestant rebellion against a Catholic emperor, and Louis XIII is most certainly Catholic and most certainly has some Protestant subjects who have rebelled in the past. Not against him. On the other hand, France is surrounded by Habsburgs, and despite being married to Anne of Austria... Louis doesn't like Habsburgs. Incidentally, Louis is also probably gay and has flings with several men and his friends actually have to force him into bed with his wife so he can produce an heir. So perhaps this ambivalence towards uh, females in general has something to do with why the royal marriage doesn't pull him in the direction of the Habsburgs. But regardless, France stays neutral at this time in the war. They have no reason to get involved in some rebellion in Bohemia, regardless of what they might secretly hope about the outcome. Meanwhile, at home in France... Uh, Charles d'Albert soon becomes even less popular with the nobles than Concini had been. When Louis first took the throne for himself, the rebellious nobles had surrendered. Louis had actually welcomed those rebellious nobles, the ones from the siege of Soissons, well, he had welcomed them to his royal court with honor, as if they had been fighting in his name against the Queen Mother's armies. But despite the Protestant nobles' hopes, their hopes are soon dashed. Indeed, so are the hopes of the Catholic nobles. See, the Albert eliminates a tax called the Paulette. This is a special tax that office holders can pay to the king in order to make their offices hereditary. So, if you're the governor of a certain region, for example, you're the governor of Brittany, you can pay one-tenth of your annual revenue to the king. And in exchange... Instead of the title reverting to the crown on your death, your son will inherit your title. Right? So despite the fact that it's a tax on them, the Paulette is actually a popular tax amongst the nobility since it allows families to remain in power. Meanwhile, the Paulette is unpopular with France's growing merchant classes. Some of these merchants are doing a lot better financially than the hereditary nobles, and they aren't getting what they think is their due in terms of status in society because those hereditary nobles can just keep paying this tax and keep their titles, and no matter how hard you work as a merchant, it's going to be virtually impossible to buy some office of your own because you know, they just keep getting inherited away. And without the Paulette tax in place, some of the wealthier merchants can now easily secure lucrative public offices for themselves, but 
by revoking this tax, uh, Dalbert really angers the nobility. And it also doesn't help that Dalbert himself is the bastard son of a priest and a chambermaid. He's sort of this low-class guy himself. He's not really part of the aristocratic club. He's only even allowed to sit on the council because Louis has made him a duke. Who is this guy who doesn't even have noble blood to come in and become the most powerful man in the land? Does not take long for this anger to boil over into action. In 1619, only a year after Charles de Albert eliminated the Paulette tax, a group of nobles break Marie de Medici out of prison, and she becomes a rallying point for yet another rebellion. And in her role as leader, Armand du Plessis becomes her chief advisor. He comes out of voluntary exile and rejoins the queen mother in her court. And in this role, he tries to mediate between Marie de Medici and Louis XIII, but Louis is firmly in the thrall of de Albert, who is his favorite person at this point. And at de Albert's urging, he releases the Prince of Condé from prison, which brings that particular Protestant noble back into Louis's good graces. Right. He had been imprisoned by Concini while Marie de Medici is in charge. Well, now Louis is in charge, and Louis has set him out of jail. And wouldn't you know it, Condé is a skilled military commander. And in August of 1620... The royal army meets the rebel army of Marie de' Medici in the field, and the royal army easily wins. This does not completely crush the rebellion, though. It just sets them back a little bit, and in October of 1620... Uh, following up on this victory, Louis XIII makes yet another major error, and he does it again at de Albert's urging. Right. He annexes a province. This is a province that has had sort of a semi-autonomous status. It's the province of Béarn in southwestern France. This was a Huguenot Protestant province with local religious liberties, and now Louis makes it royal land, and he abolishes the local government and appoints a new government made up only of Catholics and revokes Huguenot religious freedoms. On Christmas Day, a number of Protestant nobles meet in the city of La Rochelle, a major port in southwestern France, in that general area, and La Rochelle is dominated by Huguenots. So there's a heavily Protestant area in France at this time, and these people hold a vote. They decide that they don't want to be part of France anymore, they are going to form a republic, and they elect a guy named Henri, Duke of Rohan, to be their leader. So now Louis XIII is facing a Huguenot rebellion in the south of his country, and he still hasn't settled things with his mother and these nobles. And Marie de Medici's advisors urge her to raise another army. Look, Louis is vulnerable. We can take the capital, we can you know, work things out, and, uh, and get you back in charge. Well, at least most of her advisors urge that, but Armand du Plessis urges her to make up with Louis. She does. Right? What Armand says is, you know, 
he needs you now. This is the time to make peace, and Louis accepts her back at court. And Armand, as a reward for brokering this reconciliation between the king and his mother, well, he once again earns a position on the royal council. Unfortunately, uh, this guy de Albert is still around. He is appointed Constable of France, which is basically the supreme military commander, and he and Condé lead the royal armies against Rohan's Protestant rebels. They are only partially successful, but in 1622, Rohan and Louis sign a peace treaty. The Huguenots are allowed to keep their religion, and uh, they are actually able to continue military occupation of the city of La Rochelle. In return for this, they have to destroy another major fortress that they hold. They have to destroy the fortress at Montpellier, and they have to swear loyalty to Louis as their king. During this time, the royal council also gets another shake-up. Charles de Albert dies from a fever during a siege in 1621, and a man named Charles de la Vieuville takes his place, but Vieuville is a terrible financial manager and there are rumors of corruption. So, in 1622, he is replaced by Armand Duplessis. But Armand is no longer just the Bishop of Lucan. At Louis' request, the Pope has made him a cardinal. And from here on out, he is known as Cardinal Richelieu. Known in his own time as the Red Eminence. That's his nickname from the Red Cardinal's robe and the honorific title, Your Eminence. We get the Red Eminence. And Cardinal Richelieu makes it his life's work to centralize France under the control of the king. His work on behalf of Louis XIII would live on after his death, and Louis's son, Louis XIV, would be known as one of the most powerful absolute monarchs in all of history. But to someone on the ground in 1622, this would have been hard to predict. In their book, The Age of Reason Begins, American historians Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, he proceeded with equal resolution and less lenience against the nobles who still held France to be many and not one. Feudalism was by no means dead. It had fought in the religious wars for control of the central government. The great nobles still had their fortified castles, their armed forces, their private wars, their private courts, their officers of law. They still had the peasantry at their mercy and charged obstructive tolls on commerce traversing their domains. France, dismembered by feudalism and religion, was not yet a nation. It was an unstable and agitated assemblage of proud and semi-independent barons, capable at any moment of disrupting the peace and the economy of the state. Most of the provinces were ruled by dukes or counts who claimed their governorships for life and handed them on to their sons. It seemed to Richelieu that the only practicable alternative to this enfeebling chaos was to centralize authority and power in the king. Conceivably, he might have labored to balance this by restoring some measure of municipal autonomy. But he could not restore the medieval commune, which had rested on the guilds and a protected local economy. The passage from a city to a national market had undermined the guilds and the communes, and required central rather than local legislation. To minds frozen in the perspective of today, the royal absolutism desired by Richelieu seems but a reactionary despotism. In the views of history, and of the great majority of Frenchmen in the 17th century, 
it was a liberating progress from feudal tyranny to unified rule. France was not ripe for democracy. Most of its population were ill-fed, ill-clothed, illiterate, darkened with superstitions, and murderous with certainties. The towns were controlled by businessmen who could think in no other terms than their own profit or loss. And these men, hampered at every step by feudal privileges, were not disposed to unite with the lesser nobles, as in England, to establish a parliament checking the royal power. The French parliaments were not representative and legislative parliaments. They were superior courts, nurtured and mortised in precedent. They were not chosen by the people, and they became citadels of conservatism. The middle classes, the artisans, and the peasants approved the absolutism of the king as the only protection they could see from the absolutism of the lords. In 1626, in the name of the king, Richelieu issued an edict that struck at the very base of feudalism. He ordered the destruction of all fortresses except on the frontiers, and forbade in the future the fortification of private dwellings. In the same year, his older brother having been killed in a duel, he made dueling a capital crime, and when Montmercy Bouteville and the Count de Chapelle dueled nevertheless, he had them put to death. He confessed himself much troubled in spirit by this procedure, but he told his master, It is a question of breaking the neck of duels or of your majesty's edicts. The nobles vowed vengeance and plotted the minister's fall. Unquote. Well, as much as the nobles would like to get rid of this minister who is taking away their powers and giving them to the king, well, Richelieu's enemies are going to have to wait. For now, they must stand united against the Huguenots, who rebel again in 1625 to 1626, and a third time in 1627 to 1629. This third rebellion is started not by the Huguenots themselves, but by the English. The English land 6,000 troops on an island near La Rochelle to provoke another rebellion. And while the English invasion is quickly repulsed, uh, English financial and supply aid continues to flow into the city of La Rochelle, which is now a city under siege. And at La Rochelle, Richelieu personally commands the royal army. He does not do this the entire time. There are different commanders throughout the battle, but he is in command during the decisive phase. And at La Rochelle, he shows his value at a diplomat as well. See, at this time, the... Protestant Netherlands and the Spanish Empire are at war with each other. And even so, uh, Richelieu manages to rent warships from the Netherlands uh, while also securing the help of a royal fleet from Spain as well to try and bottle up this port. See, I love this about this guy. He's a priest He's a politician, he's a diplomat, and he's a general. Uh, you just don't get people like that anymore. And as the French field commander, he's going to put to use all of the skills and knowledge he learned as a young man at the military academy. Now, La Rochelle at the time is a major commercial hub located on the Bay of Biscay. That's on the French Atlantic coast. At the time, it has a population of about 28,000, which actually, believe it or not, makes it one of the most populous cities in France. And the city is built around a natural harbor. And that harbor opens into the Bay of Biscay through a narrow inlet at the south. The city has traditionally been ruled by its burghers, that's the merchant classes, 
and they have full authority over the city's defenses, and they have maintained a strong wall around the entire city with artillery mounted along the top and a moat running the full circumference. Outside of this wall, by the way, La Rochelle is surrounded by marshes to the east and west so that the only open path for a siege army is from the north. And in addition to all of this, La Rochelle's defenses have recently been overhauled. Outside the main walls, there are additional fortifications called uh, ravelins. These are separate triangular outworks where defenders can fire on any army approaching the main walls. Catch them in a crossfire. And there are additional ditches and moats and a complicated system of locks and sluices that allow the defenders to flood or unflood particular parts of the defenses as needed. The only gap in this defensive system is at the narrow opening to the inner harbor on the city's south side. And that opening is flanked by a pair of massive towers, and these towers are connected by a massive chain, and that chain is kept pulled tight across the entrance just above the waterline. So ships cannot pass through, and then when friendly ships need to get by, they'll quick lower the chain and the ship will pass through and then they'll raise the chain back up. And, oh yeah, if that's not enough, the Rochelet, the people of New Rochelle, well, they have put out detailed fake blueprints of the defenses to confuse any attackers. This is not going to be an easy or short siege. But for Cardinal Richelieu, this battle is do or die. See, papers captured from an English envoy show that Spain has been talking with England behind France's back, and they're considering revoking their support for King Louis and even secretly funding the Huguenots. These same papers also provide evidence that Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II is planning to take advantage of French weakness to seize some disputed territory along the border between France and the Empire. The Habsburgs have France surrounded. They are planning to take advantage of this Huguenot rebellion, and Cardinal Richelieu badly needs to make a show of strength. Now, Charles de Valois, who had commanded the first royal forces on the scene, he's already given Richelieu a good start. He has repaired and reinforced the Fort St. Louis, which is a fort that sits along the coast just to the west of La Rochelle. This partially isolates the city since guns on the fort can fire out into the outer harbor at approaching ships. They can also exchange cannon fire with the guns on the city walls, which they've been doing. Richelieu and this commander de Valois confer. They agree that taking La Rochelle by a direct assault is impossible. Instead, they will have to choke it off and starve out the defenders. So the royal army, numbering more than 22,000 men at this point, they dig a long trench around the city and the surrounding swampland as well to cut it off by land. They build fortifications along this trench with artillery to deter anyone from trying to break in or out. Their ships patrol outside the harbor and drive off any English ships attempting to relieve the defenders. And Louis XIII himself arrives on October 12, 1627, to supervise the siege. But 
As winter sets in, he gets tired of life in a military camp and returns to Paris, leaving Cardinal Richelieu once again in supreme command of his army. Richard Lodge writes, quote, Richelieu had now the opportunity of displaying the military tastes and capacity which he had developed in his younger days. Attired in a garb which betrayed the soldier rather than the ecclesiastic, he undertook the personal direction of the siege works by land and sea. The strictest discipline was maintained, and the cardinal triumphantly compared his camp to a well-ordered monastery. The men were well-paid, well-fed, and well-clothed, a striking contrast to the condition of most of the armies of that period, and the amount of sickness was surprisingly small. Unquote. Even as Richelieu is running this well-ordered camp, the defenders are pouring everything they have into keeping their city safe. Every man, woman, and child in La Rochelle has some role to play in the battle, whether it's bringing water to the men on the walls or repairing damage to the defenses or keeping watch over the harbor, but their food supplies are starting to dwindle. And those women and children need to eat. So the mother of the Protestant leader, the Duke of Rohan's mother, a woman named Catherine de Parthenay, and an influential rebel leader in her own right, uh, de Parthenay asks Richelieu to let women and children leave the city. Richelieu is stone cold. He replies that either everyone leaves the city, meaning they surrender, or nobody's getting out. And let's be clear what he's doing here. He's making sure there are as many people in La Rochelle as possible, especially non-combatants, specifically so that their food supply runs out faster. Well, shortly thereafter, word comes that English ships are on the way to resupply the Rochelais. And as soon as that word comes, the Spanish ships outside the harbor turn back for home. They have an excuse. They say that they plan on attacking the English next summer, but Richelieu remembers that piece of intelligence he got, saying that the Spanish were going to betray him. And more importantly, at the moment, the absence of the Spanish ships leaves him without enough ships to stop the city of La Rochelle from getting resupplied. And English ships start running the blockade and bringing food to the defenders. So Richelieu comes up with a plan. He decides to build a wall of some kind across the harbor mouth, outside the walls of La Rochelle, to completely encircle the city. Richelieu is not sure entirely how he's going to do this, but he's willing to pay for the necessary expertise, and so he hires a famous Italian engineer named Pompeo Targone to design this seawall. Now, this is no small task. The gap from one shore to the other outside the mouth of the harbor is more than nine-tenths of a mile. And whatever this structure is, it's going to have to be strong enough to stand up to erosion, and it's going to have to support the men constructing it, and what Targone ultimately does is he builds a series of wooden raft-like defenses, and they are linked together by chains, uh, this allows them to float separately on the waves and move with the water, but nonetheless to form a barrier across the harbor. And this seems to work at first, but then a storm blows in from the north and the rafts start moving really violently and at first only a couple of chains snap, but this causes a chain reaction and more and more of the 
chunks of this wall get separated from each other and all of these rafts end up just floating out into the ocean. So, Cardinal Richelieu fires Targone, the engineer, and he brings in the royal court architect for Louis XIII, a man named Clement Metazo. And Metazo designs something a little different. He designs a pair of jetties, uh, one on each side of the harbor mouth. Now, because of the soft silt at the bottom of the harbor, he first has to create a foundation. Um, he does this by uh, taking ships filled with rocks and sinking them right there at the mouth of the harbor, and they form a stable foundation where his rock workers can just pile more and more rocks on top until that section of the wall is complete, and then when they've finished a section, well, now they have a stable platform where they can step out further and work on that as they move forward to the next section, and well, you have one section coming from one side of the harbor mouth, one section from the other, and the workers are coming from both sides, and the idea is for both halves of this wall to almost meet in the middle. Uh, there's going to be a gap. It's going to be too small for a ship to go through. It's just going to be wide enough that the tide can pass in and out without washing out the wall's foundation. And to complete this task... This is almost a mile-long seawall, basically. Well, Richelieu gives Metazo command of 4,000 men. But this is still going to take time, and it's not until February of 1628 that the gap in this defense has been narrowed enough that the city is completely cut off. The English make an attempt to push through with a larger relief fleet in April, but the commander of the English fleet doesn't have any clear authority to actually open fire on French artillery positions. And when he sees the strength of all their defenses, he returns back to England without delivering any food, ammunition, or any other supplies to the city of La Rochelle. At this point, the situation inside looks grim. In order to keep his people from wavering, La Rochelle's mayor, Jean Guiton, orders that anyone who speaks of surrender is to be shot. In early spring, Louis XIII returns from Paris to find that his siege has been beautifully commanded. Meanwhile, Metazo has put his finishing touch on the seawall. So-called candlesticks. Now, these are sharpened tree trunks which are sort of pointed out at an angle from the wall, and they stick out from the front of the wall like a row of enormous pikes, and they present a foreboding obstacle to any attacking ships. I mean, you get your ship too close to these, and a wave might knock your ship into one of them and put a big hole in the side. It is from this particular construction uh, that we get a famous painting of Cardinal Richelieu, and it's probably my favorite depiction of him. Uh, and he's standing on the seawall behind the candlesticks, watching as a naval battle unfolds. He's wearing this black cuirass and pauldrons with a sword on his hip and these big military boots, but he's still wearing his red cardinal's robes under his armor with the little red cardinal's hat on his head. Accurate or not, as that image may be, uh, what a fascinating guy. Anyway, the naval battle that's happening in this painting is happening in September of 1628. See, the English have sent a third relief fleet, this one with full authority to fire on the French positions, but their assault will ultimately fail. They 
cannot destroy the seawall, nor can they sail up close enough to the coast to safely land any men because the wind is blowing out of the north and pushing their big sail ships away from shore. Regardless of the reasons, once again, there will be no relief for the people of La Rochelle. By now, the situation inside the walls is desperate. People are literally pulling grass and weeds from cracks in the walls and eating them. And the poorest citizens starve first. But as food grows scarcer and prices rise, even the powerful begin to go hungry. And by the end of October... So many people have starved that the living are resorting to cannibalism. Mayor Jean Guiton can only safely walk the streets if he's accompanied by ten armed guards, and he carries two loaded pistols at all times for fear of assassination. Then eventually, on October 26, 1628, he sends an emissary to Richelieu to ask for peace terms. On October 28th, after more than 14 months under siege, La Rochelle officially surrenders. Of the 28,000 inhabitants at the beginning of the siege, more than 22,000 men, women, and children have died. And in a bizarre twist... A storm destroys Richelieu's seawall just a few days after the surrender. The main Huguenot leader, the Duke of Rohan, will continue to fight on elsewhere in Protestant-majority lands, but after the fall of La Rochelle, his only source of foreign support is covert funding from Spain. In June of 1629, Rohan finds his own army under siege. He surrenders to Louis XIII. Both sides are tired of war, and Richelieu in particular is concerned about the Habsburg menace more than about saving face while making this peace deal. So, under the terms of peace, the Huguenots retain their religious freedom. However, they lose the right to maintain any armed fortifications anymore. Richelieu is eager to move forward, and he does what he always does. He turns an enemy into a friend. He gives Henri, the Duke of Rohan, a major leadership position in the royal army. During the last year of the Huguenot uprising, Richelieu also goes to war against the Spanish in northern Italy. He does so directly and Louis XIII goes with him. The politics here are complicated, but basically the Spanish are picking on the Duchy of Mantua, which is a French ally, and the Royal French Army defeats the Spanish troops in the area and forces their surrender before returning to France to finish off the Huguenots. In December of 1629... After the end of the Huguenot uprising, Richelieu must go again to northern Italy, this time alone, to battle both Spanish and imperial forces who are harassing France's Italian allies. Spain is at war with the Netherlands right now, and they're moving supplies through northern Italy, then through the Holy Roman Empire to their troops in the Netherlands. And these French allied states are in their way. And in his mission here, Richelieu is appointed, quote, Lieutenant General representing the person of the king with his army, both within and without the kingdom, unquote. And after some minor successes across the Alps, Richelieu returns to France to join Louis XIII in an invasion of the Duchy of Savoy, which is a large Spanish allied territory in what is now southeastern France. The invasion, which 
Richelieu orchestrates is successful. And without their Savoyard allies in northern Italy, the Spanish armies are once again forced to concede. Meanwhile, in addition to all of this fighting in northern Italy, Richelieu has been working in the background against the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II. At this point in the Thirty Years' War inside the empire, Denmark has just surrendered, and the Protestant side in the Thirty Years' War is on its knees. Now, Sweden is technically at war with the empire still, but most of the Swedish army is tied up in Poland. Well, it seems like with the Danish dropping out, the Swedish might be next, so Richelieu sends envoys to broker a peace between Sweden and Poland. And this allows Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus to put all of his focus on his war with the empire. And thanks to the fact that France is a wealthy nation at this time, uh, Richelieu is also able to help fund Sweden's armies. This keeps the Protestants in the war, in the fight against the Holy Roman Emperor, and it keeps Ferdinand from being a threat to France in the meantime. And all of this advances the interests of the French nation, but it infuriates not just the Queen Anne of Austria, but the Queen Mother Maria de' Medici. Remember, she too is a part of the Habsburg family. And by going to war against the Habsburg Spanish and supporting Protestant anti-Habsburg forces in the empire, Richelieu is going against her family's interests. And to Maria de' Medici, family is more important than nationality. And Maria gets to spend a lot of time with Louis XIII during this time. In September of 1630, Louis falls gravely ill and he nearly dies. As a matter of fact, he receives the last rites on September 20th. Now, it probably doesn't help that his doctors are bleeding him every day, but he eventually recovers. But while he was feverish... He promised his wife and his mother that he will dismiss Richelieu as soon as the war is over. Richelieu is still in northern Italy, wrapping up a few things at this time, but Marie de' Medici is ready, and she even comes up with plans for Richelieu's replacement, a family friend of hers named Michel Marillac. Richelieu begins his march back to France, and Marie is ready to put her plan into action. And here's what happens next, according to Richard Lodge. Quote, she believed that the Italian difficulty was at an end, and that Louis would now dismiss the hated minister, whom he no longer needed. To her astonishment, the king opposed an obstinate resistance to her entreaties, and refused to recognize any engagements made during his illness, and desired his mother to abandon her ill-founded enmity against the cardinal. At last, Mary's passion got the better of the crafty dissimulation which was the tradition of her family. On November 10th, she picked a violent quarrel in the king's presence with Madame de Combalet, the cardinal's favorite niece. After upbraiding her in language that would have disgraced a fishwife, she bade her leave her service and presence forever. The king himself escorted the young woman, weeping and scared by such an unexpected scene, to the door, which was soon afterwards entered by the uncle. Mary de' Medici turned her fury upon him with the same vehemence of language and gesticulation. Richelieu made no attempt to defend himself, but listened in respectful silence and quitted the room. Then the queen turned to her son, she accused the cardinal of designing to marry his niece to the Count of Soissons, to depose Louis, and to place the Count on the throne. Forgetting that she supplied evidence of a preconcerted conspiracy, she divulged her schemes for the conduct of the government after Richelieu's fall. Michel Marillac was to become chief minister, and his brother was to assume the supreme command of the army. 
the king made no attempt to interrupt or reply to this violent monologue. He retired to his chamber and threw himself in a rage upon his bed. He was unwilling to quarrel irretrievably with his mother, but he had no intention of parting with his minister. The very complaints which he had listened to only furnished a striking proof of Richelieu's fidelity. The basis of the Queen Mother's resentment was that the cardinal was more devoted to the king than to herself. Louise Chamberlain and favorite, Saint-Simon, father of the famous memoir writer, strengthened his resolution by urging that he had duties not only as a son, but also as a king, and that the cardinal was necessary to France. To escape any further maternal intimidation, the king determined to depart for Versailles. Meanwhile, Marie de' Medici had convinced herself that her son's silence implied acquiescence. The news of her victory was circulated through Paris, and couriers were sent to announce the cardinal's downfall to foreign courts. The French courtiers crowded to the Queen Mother's magnificent palace, the Luxembourg, to offer their congratulations. The rumor spread that Richelieu was collecting his papers and valuables and was preparing to depart from Paris, if not from France. And it is true that the cardinal was profoundly discouraged. He knew how a violent woman may influence, in spite of himself, a man who dislikes to have troubles and displeasure around him. He may well have feared that Mary de Medici's estimate of her success was no exaggeration. While he thus desponded and hesitated as to his future course, a messenger arrived to bid him join the king at Versailles. Louis had never really doubted as to his ultimate decision. He was conscious that his reign owed its success and its reputation to the cardinal, and if he had to choose between his mother and his minister, his mind was already made up. He only waited till he was safe from interference to announce his determination. On the next day, Michel Marillac was called upon to surrender the Great Seals, and a courier was dispatched to Schomburg, ordering him to arrest Marshal Marillac and to send him a prisoner to France. November 11, 1630 has come down to history as the Day of Dupes. Richelieu's position was all the stronger for the failure of the attack upon him. Marie de Medici was compelled to acknowledge her defeat, and in December, she controlled her rage so far as to be formally reconciled with the cardinal and to resume her seat in the council. But she had no intention of abandoning her desire for vengeance on the man who had thwarted and humiliated her. As open violence had failed, she determined to try once more the paths of intrigue. Her elder son had escaped from her influence, but she still had some control over his younger brother. Gaston's importance as heir apparent to the throne was far greater than his own abilities would have given him, and he was readily induced to fall in with his mother's wishes. In January 1631, he appeared in the cardinal's chamber and openly renounced his friendship. Directly afterwards, he set out for Orléans. It was the intention of the queen mother to rally round her second son all the elements of opposition to the monarchy and if necessary, to trust to the chances of a civil war. Richelieu fully appreciated her designs. To allow her to remain in impunity at court would only strengthen and encourage her faction, and the king was easily persuaded to separate himself from an influence which he now dreaded and disliked. The court journeyed to Compiègne, and the queen mother followed to watch her son. Early in the morning of February 23rd, the king and the cardinal hurried back to Paris. Anne of Austria was ordered to follow her husband, but was allowed to take a tender farewell of her mother-in-law, with whom she had been closely united of late years by common antipathy to Richelieu. They never met again. Marie de Medici received written instructions to retire for a time to Moulin, as circumstances made her presence at court undesirable. The princess of Consti, and other ladies of her household were exiled to their estates, and Marshal Bassompierre, an ally of the Marillacs, was committed to a prison from which he never emerged while Richelieu lived. The cardinal now tried to conciliate Gaston, but the prince was persuaded by his followers to reject all offers, and in March he retired for a second time to Lorraine. Meanwhile, Marie de Medici obstinately refused to leave Compiègne 
and endeavored to excite sympathy by representing that she was harshly imprisoned by the man whom she had raised to greatness. Her residence so near to Paris was a constant source of annoyance to the king and his minister, but they did not venture to risk unpopularity by removing her by force. Their end was at last effected by relaxing the careful watch hitherto maintained over her movements. Weary of inaction, the queen escaped from France in July and made her way to Brussels. She was destined never to revisit the country in which her marriage had enabled her to play so prominent a part. Unquote. And with Maria de' Medici out of the picture, Cardinal Richelieu is now free to serve as Louis XIII's first minister, at least for now, without anyone plotting behind his back. And indeed, Richelieu will be the first minister to the King of France from 1630 to the end of his life. And meanwhile... From 1630 to 1635, Richelieu continues to fund the Swedish war effort against the Holy Roman Empire without getting directly involved in the conflict in Germany. And to pay for this, he reforms the French tax collection system. He replaces appointees from local lords with tax assessors answerable directly to the king. This keeps local lords from taking their own cut off the top and gets more of that money where it belongs in the royal treasury, and this further centralizes French power in the hands of the king. Richelieu also works to further cement his own power he makes it clear that he is not a man to be trifled with or even lightly opposed. One of Richelieu's policies in his tenure as first minister is that he only wants walled cities on the border of France. He's getting rid of walled cities and fortified castles in the interior of France, where, as he sees it, their only purpose is to be used by rebels. And there's a city called Luton that refuses to tear down its walls and castle. A priest in the city, a man named Urbain Grandier, is one of the fiercest supporters of the city's wall, but he also has a reputation for sleeping with his parishioners and working with friends at the nearby Capuchin Friary, Richelieu concocts a fake wave of demonic possessions among a bunch of nuns there, and they say that this priest, this guy Grandier, seduced them all and that that's how they became possessed and that they're responsible, and so... Richelieu has Grandier condemned to death for sorcery and burned at the stake. Needless to say, this sends a message to the other residents of Luton, the ones who are smart enough to see through the whole demonic possession story, and public support for the wall declines considerably. Richelieu is a complicated figure. He's a hero to some and a villain to others. But one thing that annoys me about how he's been treated in the culture is that most modern people know him because he's the villain in Alexandre Dumas' novel The Three Musketeers, along with the innumerable film adaptations. In that story, he's portrayed as greedy and power-hungry, undermining the king at every turn and seeking to use the power of the French throne for his own selfish ends. But the idea of Richelieu as anything other than a dutiful servant to his king is absolutely absurd. Everything I've seen in the historical record leads me to believe that he was a faithful government official reigning in France's nobility and centralizing authority in the hands of the king. If anything, 
he could be criticized for going too far in support of Louis. Right? There are plenty of incidents like the fake possessions of Luton for which he probably should be criticized, but to suggest that he was some kind of traitor, well, that's flat-out ridiculous. Anyway, this brings us to where we were at the end of the last episode. With the death of the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus at the Battle of Lutzen in 1632. The Swedish will continue to fight on after the loss of their great leader, but without Gustavus at the helm, their armies begin to suffer setbacks, most notably at the Battle of Nordlingen in 1634, and Swedish power in Germany starts to diminish. This starts the clock ticking. If France doesn't get involved in the Thirty Years' War on the Protestant side, the Protestants are almost certain to lose. This, in turn, will increase Habsburg power. It will allow the Holy Roman Emperor to do a little centralization of his own rule. And then... The Habsburg Emperor and the Habsburg Spanish King will be free to focus on swallowing France between them once and for all. The Spanish are hoping to keep France quiet during this time. They don't do a very good job of it. They actually provide Cardinal Richelieu with an excuse to go to war. In March of 1635, they have already kidnapped the Elector of Trier. This is a Catholic bishop. He's one of the most powerful Catholic figures in the Holy Roman Empire, and he's been a supporter of the emperor throughout the Thirty Years' War. But he's also a French ally. Right? And the Spanish want him to give them a right-of-way through his land, among other concessions. He's one of those guys whose land they would like to go through for uh, the sake of their war in the Netherlands, and he's not willing to let them do that. And a little later on, in March of 1635, the French respond. French forces march into northern Italy again, and they attack Catholic imperial allies in an effort to cut off Spanish land access from the Netherlands. Fine, you're moving troops through Trier now. Well, we'll take some of this land in northern Italy. How do you like that? In May, Richelieu launches an invasion of the Spanish Netherlands itself. 27,000 French troops join with the Dutch army to wreak havoc on Spanish lands. Now, their success is only temporary. Within a few months, Spanish reinforcements arrive to throw the French army back across the border. But France is now fully committed to war against the Habsburg powers and will remain so until the end of the Thirty Years' War. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the military history here. Because most of it is just a lot of back and forth. This is a slugfest. Spain is a global empire, seems like it should have the advantage, but she's been involved in major wars for years, straining her economy. Not only that, but there's a belief in Spanish culture at this time that it's unbecoming for noblemen to engage in business. This makes Spain's leaders poorer than their other European counterparts. France, on the other hand, is a comparatively wealthy nation, and while the French Empire is a much smaller one than the Spanish, Spain no longer enjoys the same absurd level of naval dominance she enjoyed a generation before. So this is a closer fight than a lot of people at the time might have expected. A lot of observers expected that the Spanish would win this one easily. And instead, there is this long back and forth, both between northern France and the northern Netherlands, or Spanish Netherlands, 
or uh, between southern France and northern Spain. This is a two-front war, and uh, both fronts see a lot of action, but not a lot of actual territory changes hands. And meanwhile, military action inside the Holy Roman Empire is even more difficult for all parties. Right, a, less than a generation before, this was the most populous part of Europe, uh, two decades of war and constant pillaging have changed a lot of that. Right? The land has been stripped bare. Right? Huge tracts of territory are laying fallow as peasants flee for Poland or Italy or anywhere they can farm in peace without somebody's army pillaging their fields. Right? Armies can no longer live off the land like they used to. And except for planned maneuvers involving large-scale supply caravans, most of the action is limited to small bodies of troops or to quick cavalry raids. But thanks to France keeping the Spanish busy, the imperial forces aren't getting any help, and Sweden is able to maintain a foothold in northern Germany along the Baltic coast. Oh, and by the way, the Swedish homeland is nice and peaceful and so they don't have to deal with all of these you know, agricultural shortfalls and such that the imperial armies are having to grapple with at this point in the war. But outside of the military situation, I want to take a minute to talk about Cardinal Richelieu's domestic policies. What's he doing in France all this time? Well, to begin with, he is a religious moderate. He wants to maintain the status quo inside France as much as possible. And for him, this means that Catholicism is the official state religion, but Protestants are free to practice. He also pushes back against the Gallican movement. Uh, this is a French church movement that wants to create its own patriarch, like the Patriarch of Constantinople. He's a very mainstream Catholic for his time. And at the same time, by entering the Thirty Years' War on the Protestant side, he makes it clear that French foreign policy is to be dictated by the interests of the French state, not by the demands of religion. We also talked a little bit earlier about... Uh, how Richelieu was taking the tax collection system and centralizing that so it would be under the direct authority of the king. Another thing he does at this time is he reduces the number of public officials in the lands. There are thousands of judgeships across France, and judges draw a salary from the royal coffers. Now, what's happened is, unfortunately, it's become common practice for these judgeships to get handed out due to favoritism. Right, somebody does a favor for a royal official or for one of the nobles, and uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll hook you up with a judgeship, you'll get this salary for life. And, and most of these judges don't even do anything. So Richelieu reduces their number, and this frees up money for the war effort, and it simultaneously streamlines the French judicial system because there are fewer judges, and all of the ones who are being paid are actively working. Richelieu's influence even extends to the arts. Right? He is a lover of literature, and he builds his personal library and he leaves his collection to the Sorbonne upon his death. He also grants an official royal charter to the Académie Française, that is, a group of literary scholars who promote French literature. The Academy still exists today and serves as the official government authority on French grammar and vocabulary. Richelieu even takes an interest in the theater. 
This is an art form that is frowned upon in 17th century France. Don't you know those actors are just a bunch of perverts? Well, Richelieu is a fan, and he opens a theater in his own personal palace, which sets the tone for many of the other powerful people in Paris, and all of these things will help France to flourish into the cultural superpower that it would become in the next century. Like we discussed, though, the broad thrust of Richelieu's policy is centralization. The nobility are not there to rule like they did under the remnants of the old feudal system. They exist to serve the king, and the king exists to serve France. I'm about to read a passage from Richelieu's political testament. In it, he urges King Louis to always put the public interest first. Oddly enough, he uses Spain as an example of this, and while Richelieu has been criticized by his fellow Catholics for allying with the Protestants in the Thirty Years' War, let's not forget that the Spanish had been funding Protestant rebels in French lands as well. Anyway... Here is a man of the church talking about politics not from the perspective of religious interests or even dynastic interests, but from the perspective of national interests. Richelieu writes, quote, The public interest must be the only end of the prince and of his counselors, or at the least, both are obliged to take it so seriously that they put it above all others. It is impossible to conceive of the good that a prince and those who serve him in his affairs can do if they follow this principle religiously, and one cannot imagine the evil that can happen in a state when the private interest is put above the public and regulates it. True philosophy, Christian law, and politics teach us this truth so clearly that the counselors of a king should keep reminding him of such a necessary principle. Nor can the prince be too severe in punishing any of his counselors, who are miserable enough not to practice it. I cannot help but note in this regard that the prosperity that has always accompanied Spain in recent times has no other cause than the care of its council in putting the interests of the state above all others, and that most of the misfortunes that have happened to France have been caused by the excessive attachment of many of those who have been employed in its administration to their own interests, while harming those of the public. The ones have always followed the public interest, which by its nature has inspired them to do what is best for the state. And the others, by doing everything to suit themselves, have often deterred them from their proper end. Death, or a change of ministers, has never brought any transformation to the Council of Spain, but it has not been the same in this kingdom, whose affairs have not only changed with the change of councillors, but vacillated so much under the same ones that such behavior would have certainly ruined this monarchy if God in his mercy had not bailed this nation out. If the variety of our interests and our natural inconsistency often carry us to the brink of disaster, we are so frivolous and incapable of standing firm even for our own good that our enemies do not have the time to react properly and so to profit from our faults. Since your council has changed its behavior of late, your affairs have also taken a turn to the great benefit of your kingdom. And if the example of the reign of your majesty is followed in the future, your neighbors will no longer have the advantages that they have had in the past. But if this kingdom partakes of their wisdom, it will doubtless have a share in their good fortune, since although being wise and fortunate is not always the same thing, the best thing one can do to avoid being unfortunate is to take the path of prudence and reason, and not the unbridled one of most men, and particularly of the French. If those whom your majesty will trust with the care of your affairs have the capacity and integrity of which I have spoken above, you will only have to watch out for yourself concerning this matter, which should not be difficult for you, since the interest and the personal reputation of a prince only have the same end. Princes are ordinarily willing enough to enforce the general laws of their states, because by doing this, they have only reason and justice in mind, which is easy enough to do when there is no obstacle in their path. 
but when the opportunity arises to get some beneficial institutions underway. They do not always show the same firmness because this is when the interests of someone or other, piety and compassion, favor and pressures, oppose as good intentions. And they often do not have willpower to disdain those individual concerns. It is on such occasions that they must gather all their forces, keeping in mind that those whom God has chosen to govern others must do only what is best for the public and oblige it to follow altogether. Unquote. Shortly after France gets involved in the Thirty Years' War, in 1637, Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II dies. And his son, Ferdinand III, takes over. Ferdinand III is 29 years old and has only known war for the last 19 of those years. And he's tired of war. And he inherits an empire that is in bad shape both morally and financially. He immediately enacts a policy of religious tolerance and he makes overtures for peace to the other powers, but the war has taken on a momentum of its own. And not even the Holy Roman Emperor is able to stop it. By the year 1641, the back-and-forth war that kicked off in 1635, well, has started to turn in the French favor. France has pushed the Spanish all the way back across the Pyrenees. Portugal, which had been ruled by the Spanish king when the war broke out, well, it's now an open revolt, seeking to once again become independent. Slowly but surely, France is winning the war. Unfortunately, while Richelieu is only 56 years old, he is not well. He's always been frail, but now he suffers from tuberculosis, malaria, and kidney stones. Rumors of him having gonorrhea are almost certainly false. He fooled around a little as a young man. He was treated then, but Richelieu seems to have taken his vow of chastity seriously once he entered the priesthood, and the only woman in his life outside of politics is his niece, Marie Madeleine d'Aguillon, with whom he is very close. Well aware of his own mortality, Cardinal Richelieu works to complete his political testament. This is his guide to statesmanship. It's as bold and insightful as anything Machiavelli wrote. We just quoted from it. And... He also mentors a new advisor to replace him at King Louis's side. This new advisor is the 39-year-old Giulio Mazzarino. Mazzarino is a young nobleman and accomplished diplomat from Rome. As a young man, he had gotten into gambling debts in Spain and almost been forced into a marriage just to collect the dowry and pay off his debtors. Eventually, he settled down, and although he remains a little bit of what we would now call a party guy, none of this stops him from being an important diplomat. Throughout the 1630s, relations have been tense between the Pope and Louis XIII. On the one hand, the Pope is mad that France is taking the Protestant side in a war against the Emperor. On the other hand, France is a powerful Catholic nation. The war will be over someday, and it's important to keep the lines of communication open. But neither Louis XIII nor Richelieu trusts most of the bishops in Rome at the time. Most of them are Spanish, and they openly hate Cardinal Richelieu. So Mazarino becomes indispensable to both sides during Richelieu's wars with the Spanish and their proxies in northern Italy. He's somebody both sides trust. More than once, he negotiates a peace deal. In one case, as two armies are about to meet, he actually rides his horse out in the middle of the battlefield, risking his own life and 
waving a newly signed peace treaty overhead to get the two sides to back down. Because of his importance, Richelieu nominates him as a cardinal in 1639. By the end of the year, the Pope has made him one, despite the fact that he's not a priest and will never become one. In this case, the position is honorary, and it's to represent that he has done a lot of work for the Catholic Church and holds authority from the Pope. Mazzarino will now be known as Cardinal Mazarin, and he will be Richelieu's primary deputy. And just as Richelieu has guided the beginning of Louis XIII's reign, Mazarin will continue in his place all the way through the early part of Louis XIV's. Unfortunately, Cardinal Mazarin is not the only person Cardinal Richelieu has been mentoring. In 1632, he had introduced a young man named Henri Coiffier de Rues, Marquet of saint mars to the young Louis. At the time, Richelieu had been using saint mars to distract Louis's attention from other young noblemen who were vying for their own interests. Right? Remember, Louis is gay, and while well, he didn't think about things quite the same way in France at the time, he uh, certainly preferred the company of men to the company of women, and Richelieu wants to make sure that he has some input over the type of young men Louis is associating with, and this distraction works. Louis likes Saint Mars. He appoints him as the royal master of horse and seduces him more than once. But Saint Mars, uh, he prefers the company of women, and he starts pursuing a young noblewoman of superior rank. Now, She refuses his advances, but she says that she will reconsider if he earns a higher position. So, in early 1642, Saint Mars appeals to Cardinal Richelieu for an army command and a position at court. This will perhaps be prestigious enough for him to wed the lady of his dreams and stop having to sleep with the king. Richelieu refuses him this position, and Saint Mars then goes to Louis and asks him to overrule his first minister and give him this position anyway, but Louis refuses. At this point, Saint Mars goes to visit Gaston of Orléans. Right? If you'll recall, that is Louis the Thirteenth's younger brother, who has plotted more than once to usurp the throne already, and. Saint Mars and Gaston, uh, they conspire with the Spanish to hand over the city of Sedan in northern France to a Spanish army. And after handing over this city, they're going to march to Paris at the head of this army, and they're going to overthrow Louis the Thirteenth. Gaston even plans to have Richelieu assassinated. However. Gaston makes a mistake. He miscalculates. He tries to involve Louis's wife, Anne of Austria, in the plot. As a Habsburg and a relative of the Spanish king and the emperor, Gaston assumes she will be happy to see her husband overthrown in favor of a pro-Habsburg king. It's not exactly clear what happens next, It's sometimes the case with these type of palace intrigues. We get different versions of the story from different people. But I'm going to go with Will and Ariel Durant's version of the story. They write that Anne of Austria believes that Louis will die soon. He's not in good health. And their son, who will one day become Louis XIV, is only four years old at this time. This means that Anne will presumably get to be regent for some time. She will get to rule in Louis's place for more than long enough to set things right with Spain and the Empire, and her son will take over then, and her own blood will be king instead of this brother-in-law Gaston who is 
not related to her by blood. So Anne sends a messenger to Richelieu with news of the plot. Richelieu, in turn, goes to Gaston, and he pretends that he knows everything. He has a copy of Gaston's agreement with the Spanish, and he's going to go straight to Louis if Gaston doesn't confess first. And so Gaston confesses everything, and he rats out all of his co-conspirators. So despite planning a rebellion, Gaston is only lightly punished. He loses some military titles. I mean, he is the king's little brother after all. He's not going to get executed. St. Mars, on the other hand, well, he is beheaded on the orders of Cardinal Richelieu himself. When the Red Eminence gets word of the execution, he supposedly says, I wish I could see the look on his face now. By now, in late 1642, Cardinal Richelieu is near death. Even as the conspiracy of Sank Mars comes to an end, he is preparing for his own involuntary removal at the hands of the Grim Reaper. Here is what 19th century French statesman and historian Francois Guizot has to say about Richelieu's final days. In Part 5 of his book, A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, he writes, quote, For several months past, the cardinal's health, always precarious, had taken a serious turn. It was from his sick bed that he, a prey to cruel agonies, directed the movements of the army and, at the same time, the prosecution of Saint Mars. All at once his chest was attacked and the cardinal felt that he was dying. On the 2nd of December, 1642, public prayers were ordered in all the churches. The king went from Saint-Germain to see his minister. The cardinal was quite prepared. I have this satisfaction, he said, that I have never deserted the king, and that I leave his kingdom exalted and all his enemies abased. He commended his relatives to his majesty, who on their behalf will remember my services. Then, naming the two secretaries of state, Chavigny and Denoyer, he added, Your Majesty has Cardinal Mazarin. I believe him to be capable of serving the king. And he handed to Louis XIII a proclamation which he had just prepared for the purpose of excluding the Duke of Orléans from any right to the regency in case of the king's death. The preamble called to mind that the king had five times already pardoned his brother, recently engaged in a new plot against him. The king had left the cardinal, but without returning to Saint-Germain. He remained at the Louvre. Richelieu had in vain questioned the physicians as to how long he had to live. One only dared to go beyond commonplace hopes. Monseigneur, he said, In twenty-four hours, you will be dead or cured. That is the way to speak, said the cardinal, and he sent for the priest of Saint Eustache, his parish. As they were bringing into his chamber the Holy Eucharist, he stretched out his hand, and there, said he, is my judge, before whom I shall soon appear. I pray him with all my heart to condemn me, if I have ever had any other aim than the welfare of religion and of the state." The priest would have admitted certain customary questions, but treat me as the commonest of Christians, said the cardinal, and when he was asked to pardon his enemies, I have never had any but those of the state, answered the dying man. The cardinal's family surrounded his bed, and the attendance was numerous. The bishop of Lisieux, Cospdan, a man of small wits but of sincere devoutness, listened attentively to the firm speech, the calm declarations of the expiring minister. So much self-confidence appalls me, he said below his breath. Richelieu died as he had lived, without scruples and without delicacies of conscience, absorbed by his great aim and but little concerned about the means he had employed to arrive at it. 
I believe absolutely all the truths taught by the church, he had said to his confessor, and this faith sufficed for his repose. The memory of the scaffolds he had caused to be erected did not so much as recur to his mind. I have loved justice and not vengeance. I have been severe towards some in order to be kind towards all, he had said in his will, written in Latin. He thought just the same on his deathbed. The king left him not without emotion and regret. The cardinal begged Madame d'Aguillon, his niece, to withdraw. She is the one whom I have loved most, he said. Those around him were convulsed with weeping. A Carmelite whom he had sent for turned to those present and said, Let those who cannot refrain from showing the excess of their weeping and their lamentation leave the room. Let us pray for this soul. In presence of the majesty of death and eternity, human grandeur disappears irrevocably. The all-powerful minister was at that moment only this soul. A last gasp announced his departure. Cardinal Richelieu was dead. He was dead, but his work survived him. On the very evening of the 3rd of December, Louis XIII called to his council Cardinal Mazarin, and next day he wrote to the parliaments and governors of the provinces, God having been pleased to take to himself the Cardinal de Richelieu, I have resolved to preserve and keep up all the establishments ordained during his ministry, to follow out all projects arranged with him for affairs abroad and at home, in such sort that there shall not be any change. I have continued in my councils the same persons as served me then, and I have called thereto Cardinal Mazarin, of whose capacity and devotion to my service I have had proof, and of whom I feel no less sure than if he had been born amongst my subjects. Scarcely had the most powerful kings yielded up their last breath when their wishes had been at once forgotten. Cardinal Richelieu still governed in his grave. Unquote. If not for Cardinal Mazarin, Richelieu's rule from beyond the grave might have been short-lived. On May 14, 1643, Louis XIII dies from intestinal tuberculosis. While he asked in his will that Anne of Austria not be made regent, she immediately goes to the Parliament of Paris, which is basically a Paris judicial court, and has that clause of his will annulled. And thereby, Anne of Austria becomes the regent of France, ruling in place of her son, Louis XIV. But Louis XIII only had two senior ministers at the time of his death, Cardinal Mazarin and his foreign minister, Leon Boutillier. Boutillier has been in Richelieu's camp for over a decade and has faithfully executed his foreign policy. In Mazarin, on the other hand, Anne sees someone who might be friendlier to the Habsburgs and chooses him as her first minister. But far from abandoning Richelieu's nationalist policies, Mazarin would continue to prosecute his predecessor's wars. For another five years, the Thirty Years' War will continue to rage. But the course of history has been changed and the final treaty may as well have been written by the Red Eminence himself. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan, and I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description. 
and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.